Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. It is good to be with you. Thank you for joining us. Lawmakers listened to emotional testimony from four police officers today. They detailed the terror and violence they experienced on January 6th while defending the U.S. Capitol from a mob who rioted while declaring their support for former President Trump. The House Select Committee began the first hearing of its investigation into the Capitol riot with a compilation of raw video from the assault. We are going to play that in full for you. And a warning, this video is graphic and contains offensive language. Hey, brother, we're boots on the ground here. We're moving on to Capitol now. I'll give you a boots on the ground update here in a few. Multiple Capitol injuries! Multiple Capitol injuries! <laughs> Okay, guys, um, apparently this tip of the spear has entered the Capitol building.
They've got the gallows set upside this Capitol building. It's time to start using them. Start making a list. Put all those names down. And we start hunting them down one by one. Mobilize in your own cities, your own counties, storm your own Capitol buildings, and take down every one of these corrupt Shortly before the hearing started, House GOP leadership held a press conference just outside the Capitol, standing on the same spot where the rioters did on January 6th. Number three House, Republic, House Republican Elise Stefanik sought to place the blame on Democrats. In December of 2020, Nancy Pelosi was made aware of potential security threats to the Capitol, and she failed to act. It is a fact that the U.S. Capitol Police raised concerns and rather than providing them with the support and resources they needed and they deserved, she prioritized her partisan political optics over their safety. The American people deserve to know the truth that Nancy Pelosi bears responsibility as Speaker of the House for the tragedy that occurred on January 6th. And it was only after Republicans started asking these important questions that she refused to seat them. Responding officers who testified Tuesday morning had a different view. Again, we want to warn you about graphic and offensive language. I was aware enough to recognize I was at risk of being stripped of and killed with my own firearm. I was electrocuted again and again and again. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. What we were suggested that they was like something from a medieval battle, we fought hand to hand, inch by inch, to prevent an invasion of the Capitol by a violent mob intent on subverting our democ democratic process. The rioters attempted to breach the Capitol were shouting, Trump, send us. Pick the right side. We want Trump. One woman in a pink MAGA shirt yelled, you hear that, guys? This voted for Joe Biden. Then the crowd, perhaps around 20 people, joined in screaming, boo. No one had ever, ever called me a while wearing the uniform of a Capitol Police officer. CBS News senior investigative correspondent Catherine Herridge joins me now. She has been following today's hearing as part of her extensive coverage of the Capitol riot investigation. Hi there, Catherine. I know you have been continuing your comprehensive work and following this investigation. I wonder what you think the impact was of hearing such personal stories from these officers who defended the Capitol and what stood out to you in terms of new information we learned. Well, Elaine, we've seen some of these videos before, and we've read the stories, but somehow combining that very graphic video with the personal stories of the men who lived it offered a new emotional depth to our understanding of what unfolded on January 6th. As we watched the testimony, you could hear it in their voices, kind of a taut anxiety as they described the events. In some cases, you could see real fear in their eyes describing what happened that day and then the ripple effect of the trauma. And then some of them simply broke down in tears as they spoke. One of the witnesses describes how he had been in Iraq, but he felt safer in Iraq working with the Army, responding to roadside bombings than he felt on Capitol Hill on January 6th. And it was the courageous testimony of these four officers sharing what are these very deep wounds that I felt made it almost a share wound, shared wound for the nation as we understand not only what happened on that day, but the events leading up to January 6th, Lane. Absolutely. You could hear and feel the pain um, just coming mm -hmm. through with their testimony. Mm -hmm. We know, Catherine, that the Justice Department says former Trump administration officials will be allowed to testify before this committee. What might that mean, and what can you tell us about the former Trump officials who've testified about January 6th before other committees? 
Well, Elaine, based on our reporting here at CBS, we were able to confirm that Justice Department officials have spoken to the top lawyer at the White House, and they've agreed that it would not be appropriate to block testimony of former Trump administration aides on the basis of what's called executive privilege, which typically shields the conversations between a president and his immediate circle. If this goes ahead, my expectation is that the issue will probably be litigated and end up in the courts. To the second part of your question, I think the most important testimony we had so far from the last administration was the acting secretary of defense, Chris Miller. And based on an internal timeline at the Defense Department obtained by CBS News, he said that on January 4th, so two days before the riots, the Capitol Hill police chief had confirmed that they did not want additional Department of Defense help beyond what was already requested by the D.C. mayor. And the D.C. mayor planned to use the guard for traffic control and for crowd control. They did not plan to use them to in any way support the Capitol Hill police that day. And what Miller said in his testimony is that he did not have the ability to force the guard on the Capitol and had to wait for that call on the 6th. And when it came and the crisis was upon them, they could not respond with the kind of speed that everyone saw was required, Elaine. In our final minute or so that we have mm -hmm. left, Catherine, um, you've been tracking the investigation into those pipe mm -hmm. bombs left outside mm -hmm. the Republican and Democratic National Committee's uh, headquarters on January 6th. What is the latest on that? Well, the FBI, Elaine, is offering a reward of $100,000. And based on my reporting, I understand that the FBI has few, if any, actionable leads in this particular case. You remember a couple of months ago, the FBI took the unusual step of releasing this video of the pipe bomb suspects. You see them there in the left-hand corner of your screen. The reason this video is so important is that it showed how the suspect walked. And law enforcement does something called gait analysis. Most people don't realize that the way that they walk is as individual as their DNA or their fingerprint. And the FBI had hoped that someone at home would recognize the mannerisms of that individual and it would lead to a breakthrough in the case. But I'm sorry to report, based on my reporting, that has not happened at this time. And those pipe bombs, that is really the missing link or the loose thread in all of this. They were planted the night before the riots. So what was the intention? Was it to shut down the Electoral College vote? If they had gone off that evening, it would have created a ring of steel around the Capitol, and that certainly would have changed the dynamic on the 6th of Lane. Right. So many open questions at this point. Catherine mm -hmm. Harridge for us. Catherine, thank you very much. For more, let's bring in Caitlin Huey Burns, Courtney Subramanian, and Daniel Lipman. Caitlin is CBSN's Washington reporter. Courtney is a White House correspondent for USA Today. And Daniel. So, Daniel, um, let me ask you about White House reaction. Um, as we heard from Catherine, you know, we have seen a lot of these videos. We have heard from officers, but it was a quite different experience to see it kind of together in the way that it was presented today. What has been the White House reaction to today's testimony? I think the White House, uh, you know, has basically said that this is an important uh, thing for history and for getting to the bottom of the security failures uh, and, you know, the truth of what happened. Uh, to, you know, it's important to hear from uh, the uh, from a range of people, especially uh, at the start of this uh, hearing process, the cops who were protecting the Capitol and were injured uh, and called these horrible racist slurs. Uh, and so I think the White House is recognizing the heroism uh, of these uh, people who testified. Uh, and, you know, saying that this is a worthwhile effort. Uh, and I'm sure that they're happy that there are some Republicans involved, uh, even if, uh, you know, this is something that is more Democratic-led. They still have Adam Kinzinger, they have Liz Cheney, um, and, you know, and, and others who are advising uh, those members. Caitlin, some members of Congress, as we have seen, became emotional recalling the events of January 6th. Can you just describe what the atmosphere is like there on Capitol Hill on this day? And explain to us why it is that Democrats and Republicans are framing what happened on that day so very diff differently. 
That's right. We saw emotional testimony from those four officers, and we also saw emotional reaction from the lawmakers themselves. Uh, a couple of them were actually tearing up when they were asking their questions or giving their opening statement. Adam Kinzinger, Adam Kinzinger the Republican on the panel, uh, teary-eyed. Adam Schiff also got emotional as well as some others because they were there that day and they realized or uh, they were trying to remind the audience that officers like these four present at the hearing today were that last line of defense, really. Um, and they kind of realized how much uh, their lives uh, were at stake here. Uh, but you're right. The Republicans and Democrats up here on Capitol Hill are viewing this very differently six months after the fact. Remember, six months ago, when this was had just happened, you had Kevin McCarthy and other Republican leaders uh, blaming President Trump. Now you have Kevin McCarthy and Republican House leaders trying to shift the blame to Nancy Pelosi, arguing uh, without much evidence here, and actually contrary to, to evidence and her role here, that that she's somehow responsible for uh, the capital security. Um, and, and that's really remarkable, Elaine, because we've seen this kind of evolution, the shift within the Republican Party over the past six months and how they view what happened there. And that's also um, well, what happened here. And that's also reflective in our polling. We've seen about a 10 point drop between now and January in terms of Republicans who disapprove of what the rioters did that day. And this comes as as Republicans have been trying to downplay that. Now, that's why we heard from the lawmakers on this panel and from the Capitol Police officers and Metro Police officers testifying today, trying to refute that idea that, that this is, had, had, is, is open to be downplayed or that it's just time to move on. What was really striking from the testimony today was how much uh, these officers were saying, it, you can't move on, that maybe January 6th, um, was a one-day occurrence for some people, but for them who experienced it firsthand and we saw and heard from them in their testimony, those uh, physical and um, that physical and emotional trauma is, is not only still raw, it, it lingers and will never go away in their view. Um, and so that's why they wanted to have this committee. That's why, as Republican Liz Cheney said, she wanted to have a bipartisan commission to really get to the bottom of this. And it's just striking here on Capitol Hill to have, um, you know, this, this very apparent evidence that we've had for months and months and months and have two different versions of, of what happened. And Caitlin, can you clarify for us, what is the status of Congress approving funding for the Capitol Police Department? It's a great question, Elena. We actually have some news on that today. Uh, the Senate negotiators, um, Republican um, Richard Shelby and Appropriations Chairman um, Pat Leahy came to an agreement today for a two mil $2 billion uh, supplemental uh, security bill. Um, this would include uh, about um, 300 million for capital security, uh, about 520 million to uh, repay back the National Guard. Um, it also includes 70 million for capital police overtime and hazard pay, and also includes a billion dollars of assistance for um, Afghan refugee uh, assistance. Um, this is significant because the House passed a measure uh, a few months ago, and it has just been kind of stalling here. There was some opposition actually on the House side by some progressive Democrats who were concerned about uh, that kind of funding for Capitol Police without, as they say, accountability. Um, but today they reached, uh, Senate, uh, in the Senate at least, they've reached an agreement, um, and they feel confident about being able to secure those votes. So we'll see where it goes, but it's significant that that came down today, considering uh, the testimony that we saw, considering the timeline, the calendar is shrinking. Lawmakers are heading out for recess here soon. Uh, this was a significant um, deal reached, and we'll see if they can get support. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's also turn to the pandemic. Now, Courtney, after fielding numerous questions about mask mandates coming back, the White House is changing course from just a few days ago. Here's Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Let's listen. The reality is we are dealing with a much different strain of this virus than we were 
uh, even earlier in the spring, back in May. We will be looking at uh, the rates in different areas where the president may visit, and also the rates uh, as they, if they move in Washington, D.C., and we will apply guidance accordingly. That means we will be prepared to wear masks again if, if required, if, uh, if the guidance is, is, is leading to that, as would the president. So this new guidance is coming from the CDC. Courtney, can you explain why the White House is facing political heat? Yeah, well, you know, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky um, told reporters on a, a call this afternoon that the decision came down, you know, after data suggested that uh, vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant, uh, which is thought to be two times more transmissible um, than previous strains, uh, can have as much viral load as unvaccinated people who've been affected. Um, so, you know, this comes, of course, two months after the CDC announced that vaccinated people did not have to wear masks indoors or outdoors because vaccines provided adequate protections at a time when cases were dropping sharply. We saw, a, you know, a huge celebration at the White House uh, on July 4th with the president um, sort of declaring it as a moment that, um, you know, there that we had become independent or we were becoming independent um, from the, the virus. Um, now the administration is saying with the Del Delta variant accounting for almost all hospitalizations and deaths, um, public health officials had to make the call that while, you know, vaccinated people are unlikely to become severely ill, the new data suggests that they might transmit the variant more easily um, than earlier strains. Um, and so, you know, the White House has really um, gone to great lengths to promote the messaging that vaccinated people um, can return to some semblance of normal life um, by not having to wear this masks or wear masks. Um, but now they're having to recall that guidance. And so, um, you know, they're facing some of this political heat because there's um, concern that it can confuse people and, and possibly, um, you know, uh, keep people who might be hesitant to get the vaccine um, away from uh, actually getting the vaccine, because the idea was to promote what, uh, you know, incentives for getting a vaccine. And now if everyone's having to wear a mask, um, you know, that sort of keeps that, that skepticism in place for some people. Right. Well, Daniel, earlier today, the White House outlined a blueprint to overhaul the U.S. immigration system. Does it finally address longstanding concerns about a pathway to citizenship for so-called dreamers? Yeah, I think they really want to address the dreamer issue. This is something that uh, Biden uh, almost kind of ran on in terms of he did not want the dreamers to affect, you know, to be affected by these types of uh, pol these draconian policies uh, that President Trump had put in place, uh, you know, he helmed by Stephen Miller and various DHS secretaries. Uh, and so they think they're worried that uh, the Dreamer program could be in jeopardy, uh, you know, one day with a more supreme, a more conservative Supreme Court. And so they're trying to find uh, a congressional solution uh, to that and also uh, seeing if they can um, you know, kind of finagle immigration into this reconciliation package, uh, which progressives are really urging, but that is still unclear if that uh, would actually be put into that infrastructure package. Yeah, so Courtney, on infrastructure, earlier today, West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin seemed to draw a line in the sand. I, I want to make sure you understand. Good for you. We're trying to get this bill done. This is the most important bill we have in front of us right now. Then they'll move over to talk about the larger bill. If the bipartisan bill falls apart, then I think everything falls apart. So, Courtney, what is the latest on infrastructure? How close are they to a deal? Well, President Biden met with uh, Senator Kristen Sinema this morning at the White House. Um, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki was uh, uh, very positive about the meeting. She said they were enthusiastic about getting the bipartisan infrastructure plan across the finish line. She said they were both optimistic about a path forward. Um, bipartisan negotiators say they are close to reaching an agreement, um, but they still appear to be haggling over a few unresolved issues, um, you know, including funding levels, uh, how to finance the deal, uh, which means talks are likely to continue, you know, later into the week. Um, lawmakers are scheduled to leave for an August recess at the end of 
the week, but uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said today um, that lawmakers would have to work into the weekend to finalize a deal before leaving. You know, he said, we're not there yet, but we're making progress. He's echoing that sense of optimism that we're seeing coming from the White House. Um, but he also did not commit to a hard deadline for ending negotiations. So, uh, you know, the clock is, is ticking and time is running out. All right, Caitlin Huey Burns, Courtney Subramanian, and Daniel Lipman, thank you all very much.